Greetings fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on the feast of St. Isaac Jogues and the North American Martyrs introduced one by one because the North American Martyrs tend to be referenced as a sort of general group. Unless you've taken the time to read up on them, these eight men figure in a vague crowd of black-robed priests with halos against a backdrop of evergreen trees. Where is it now? Canada? Newfoundland? New York? Wherever it is, there are tomahawk-wielding natives hiding in the branches. We know that, right? For those who aren't quite sure, I'd like to pull each of these saints out of the fuzzy picture and into a little bit of focus today. There is so much more to the history of these men and the spine-tingling stories of their lives than I can possibly relay, even in a long quick take. The best I can do is whet your appetite to go find a book and read about these legends of our faith, each one a fascinating individual, but all with the common goal of saving souls for the love of God, and every life story more exciting and far more important than anything you'll ever see coming out of Hollywood. First, St. Isaac Jogues. Undoubtedly the most immediately recognized name of the Fellowship of the North American Martyrs is St. Isaac Jogues. It's his name that we see printed in our Catholic calendars on this day, and he was without a doubt a leader among the missionaries. His story seems to touch every other one of the North American martyrs. For perspective, the setting of these heroic tales is the territory of New France, which at the time of the early Jesuit missions encompassed the area of North America roughly surrounding the St. Lawrence River near the northeast border between the U.S. and Canada, and then inland to the eastern Great Lakes, as well as Newfoundland and Acadia. By the mid-18th century, New France had expanded to include more of the Great Lakes region and parts of the western Appalachia, but for the purposes of this history, think upstate New York and upstream along the St. Lawrence River to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and surrounding territories. This was home to the indigenous tribes, the Huron and Iroquois, and the offshoot Mohawk tribes, among others. Now, St. Isaac Jogues stands as an appropriate representative of the North American martyrs, rightly so. Though each of them started from different places in background, temperament, and talent, St. Isaac Jogues' example of courage, faith, and zeal for souls is a pattern card for the entire group. The fifth of nine children, Isaac was born to a middle-class family in Orléans, France in 1608. He was homeschooled until the age of 10, then educated by the Jesuits until he professed simple vows in the order in 1626. He was ordained a priest in the Society of Jesus 10 years later at 29 years of age. Known as a fairly capable scholar with an aptitude in languages, St. Isaac left France soon after his ordination in the company of a troop of fellow Jesuits, including Charles Garnier, destined for New France. He was, more than most, an obviously indomitable spirit. In his first letter home to his mother, he wrote, I do not know what it is to enter heaven, but this I know that it would be difficult to experience in this world a joy more excessive and more overflowing than I felt in setting foot in the new world and celebrating my first Mass on the day of the visitation. His letters home never lost this enthusiasm. Even though he was often ill, cold, and challenged with a population of pagans who regarded him and his fellow missionaries with suspicion at the least, and hatred more often than not, he carried on with a hearty optimism, adjusting remarkably well to the hardships of life in the wilderness. His spiritual director wrote of him, quote, it would have been well if I had learnt from Father Jogues the manner of praying and making thanksgiving after Mass as from a soul, if I could use the phrase, glued to the blessed sacrament. It was before this hidden God that he performed all his spiritual exercises, his prayers, his bravery, and he did not mind the bitterness of the cold nor the annoyance of the insects. 
St. Isaac reveled in the difficulty of life among the Indians, and practically hooted for joy with every new challenge and discovery. And there were many discoveries. He was the first European to stand on the shores of what is now Lake George, and its being the feast of Corpus Christi, he naturally gave it its first name, a better one than George, the Lake of the Blessed Sacrament. He was also the first priest to visit the Dutch colony in what is now Manhattan, and brought Mass and the sacraments to the two Catholics living there, even though he had only just escaped a year of imprisonment and torture among the Mohawks, and was en route to Europe to, among other things, receive a dispensation from the Pope to offer Mass with one hand, having lost most of the fingers on his left hand, because they had been chewed off by Indians. Pope Urban the Eighth happily allowed the dispensation, referring to Father Jogues as a living martyr. Father Jogues had a short respite of mission life while he waited his audience with the Pope, taking the opportunity to visit his mother, and owning every reason to remain in Europe. Heaven knows no one would have blamed him if he'd stayed, as he was suffering from extreme malnutrition and exposure, not to mention the mutilations. But his only goal and aim was to secure his ability to offer Mass and return as soon as possible to New France and the souls he was determined to win for Christ. Seeing the spark of divine commission in this stalwart priest, his superior sent him back to the New World after a few short months, and much to the astonishment of the Mohawks, the first thing our saint did was go call on his captors. You often hear St. Isaac Jogues called the Apostle of the Mohawks, but the Mohawks themselves called him Undesunk, which translates as the Indomitable One. An apt description. St. Isaac Jogues was not one to give up. You'll notice that this drawing of him made by a contemporary doesn't depict a particularly big or burly-looking man, but by all accounts and by the facts of his life, it's undisputed that he possessed not only heroic powers of physical endurance, but phenomenal mental strength and unshakable faith and virtue. In one of his dispatches detailing the news of his missions to his superiors back in France, he admitted that in reference to the year he was imprisoned, quote, the only sin I can remember during my captivity is that I sometimes looked on the approach of death with complacency. When death did come, he didn't flinch. After a time of comparative peace, an epidemic broke out amongst the Mohawks. Caterpillars infested their crops and famine threatened. And of course, the Mohawks blamed their troubles on the missionaries, whom they called the Black Coats. In October 1646, while traveling between the missions, St. Isaac Jogues and the layman Jean de Lalande met a party of Mohawks on the warpath and were taken prisoner. Those stalwart Jogues spoke well for himself, and by his reputation had already merited release by many in the Mohawk leadership. A minority faction took matters into its own hands, feigning a peaceful meeting, Members of the Bear Clan invited the priest to pay them a visit, and as he entered the cabin of the chief, he was waylaid and brutally tomahawked. Lalande met the same fate the next day. Their heads were placed on poles on the path as a warning to other black robes. Their bodies were thrown into a nearby ravine, and their souls made an arrow-straight path to heaven. But here's an interesting twist. One of those God instances, I think we might call it, when the Almighty nudges along the effect of a good man's sacrifices and prayers. The Mohawk brave, who wielded the tomahawk that killed St. Isaac Jogues, was apprehended by the law enforcers of New France, and while waiting in prison, he was converted and baptized, taking the name Isaac before his execution. The reputation of St. Isaac's valor and that of his fellow martyrs influenced the simple but highly disciplined and courageous natives as almost nothing else could. Before many years had passed, missionaries were received by the Mohawk peacefully, and converts were traveling to the seminary in Quebec to follow more closely in the footsteps of the brave black robes, many of themselves becoming black robes. Just as God had intended, 
though the road to these conversions was a rocky one. St. Isaac Jogues explains his success among the Indians, quote, My confidence is placed in God, who does not need our help for accomplishing his designs. Our single endeavor should be to give ourselves to the work and to be faithful to him, and not to spoil his work by our shortcomings. St. Isaac Jogues, pray for us. Next is St. Jean de Lelande. Little is known about the layman St. Jean de Lelande, the companion of St. Isaac Jogues, except that he was a native of Dieppe, Normandy. The date of his birth is lost to history as well, but we do know that he arrived in New France in 1642 as a lay brother with a company of Jesuits, and we know that he lived, worked, and died for the salvation of souls. It was in the village of Osser Nenon, about ten miles west of the present-day town of Arisville, New York, that both Jean de Lelande and Father Jogues were killed in the cabin of the Bear Clan, as mentioned already. Jean had not accompanied Father Jogues to the cabin, and was not witness to his murder, but having been told what had happened to the priest by sympathetic members of the larger tribe, Jean snuck out in the dusky hours of early morning to retrieve the body of his friend and mentor in order to provide a proper burial. A guard of the bear clan, however, detected his movement in the trees and killed him with a blow to the head. St. Jean de Lelan entered into an eternity of happiness in 1646. It's believed he was in his late thirties at the time of his death. St. Jean de Lelan, pray for us. Now St. Gabriel Lalemant. It was most likely due to Father Gabriel Lalemant that St. Isaac Jogues first heard his call to the mission of New France. Father Lalemant, born in Paris in 1610, was the son of a French lawyer and the third of six children, five of whom entered religious life. Added to this family of religious, two of Gabriel's uncles served the Jesuits in New France, Charles Lalemant as the first superior of the Jesuit missions in Canada, and Jerome Lalemant, who became the vicar general of Quebec. Gabriel joined the Jesuits in 1630 at the age of 20, and in due time vowed to devote himself to foreign missions, but his repeated requests to go to New France were declined, due in part to his poor health. But it pays, as they say, to have friends in high places, and between God and his uncle Jerome, he was permitted to sail to the New World in 1646. Before he began his missionary career, however, St. Gabriel Lalemant was the master of novices at the seminary in Rouen when young Isaac Jogues was a novice. It was the tales of Father Lalemant told to his wide-eyed novices and the excerpts of letters sent from his two brothers serving as missionaries in the colony of New France that inspired the young priest Isaac Jogues to follow the French missionaries to the outer reaches of the known world. St. Gabriel Lalamont, who was described by a fellow missionary in New France as a man of extremely frail constitution, nevertheless proved to have the heart of a lion. After three years laboring amongst the natives, his holy resolve was put to a last test. In spring 1649, while most of the friendly Huron warriors were away from the village of St. Ignace at the tip of the mitten of Michigan, Twelve hundred Iroquois attacked the settlement. Eighty Huron warriors fought to delay the attackers in order to enable the elderly women and children to escape. Father Gabriel and Father Jean de Berbeuf remained behind to aid the warriors. They were captured and tortured before being killed. Following is an account of the method of torture. Feel free to skip forward if you like. This is not easy to hear, but it does help us understand the heroism of the sacrifice of these saints. According to Jesuit records, quote, The attackers pulled out the fingernails of the two Jesuits and chewed their fingers before forcing them to run unclothed through the snow to another village where other Iroquois warriors waited. The captives were then forced to run the gauntlet, and then the two Jesuits were led to two posts where they were to be killed. Lalamont had to watch the torments that Brebeuf suffered before the time came for his own torture at six in the evening. His tormentors set a fire about his feet, then burned him with heated metal hatchets and poured scalding water over his head. 
After they cut off his hands and gouged out his eyes, they placed hot coals in the sockets. Then they stopped for the night, so that their victim could endure another day of torture. The next day they shoved burning wood into his mouth and sliced off his tongue. But Father Lalamont proved as courageous as his Jesuit companion and refused to shriek for mercy. Finally, they tore his heart out and ate it to gain his courage. The young Jesuit, only thirty-six years old, died after fifteen hours of unbelievable torment. Together with Brebeuf, his body was buried near the chapel door of Saint Marie. End quote. Father Jean de Brebeuf was martyred on the 16th of March, 1649, and Father Gabriel Lalamont on the 17th of March. Father Gabriel had only been working in the mission field for six months when he received his eternal reward. St. Gabriel Lalamont, pray for us. Now, St. René Goupil. St. René Goupil was baptized in a small town near Angers in the province of Anjou, France, in May 1608, the son of Hippolyte and Luce Goupil. He was working as a trained surgeon in Orléans, France, when he realized a calling to leave the world, and applied to join the Jesuits in Paris, entering as a novice in 1639. Owing, however, to deafness, he was not permitted to continue his studies toward the priesthood. Accepting this as God's will that he persevere as a lay brother in the order, René volunteered to join the missionary work in the New World where his skill in medicine could be a help to the priests. He arrived in New France in 1640 and was stationed at the St. Joseph de Sillery Mission near Quebec, where he was indeed welcomed to head the clinic that cared for the sick and wounded. Two years later, an opportunity presented itself to travel to one of the Huron missions with a group of about 40 other people, including several Huron chiefs and Father Isaac Jogues. St. René jumped at the chance. But his time in the missions was short. Before the company reached its destination, it was captured by the Mohawk and taken to the village of Osernanon, where the men were tortured in the tried-and-true Mohawk way— but these men of God didn't let a little thing like captivity and torture get in the way of conversions, taking every opportunity to lead souls to the faith. And so it happened that René Goupil was seen by a Mohawk teaching a child the sign of the cross and was killed by a blow to the head with a tomahawk on the feast of St. Michael the Archangel, September 29, 1642. Father Jogues was present and was able to give Goupil absolution before he died. Father Jogues recorded that it was with the holy name of Jesus on his lips. Many of the 24 Huron accompanying Father Jogues and René Goupil were baptized Catholic converts, and as such were punished cruelly by the Mohawks before being murdered, many of them very likely additional unnamed martyrs. St. Isaac Jogues wrote of St. René Goupil, quote, we begged God to accept our lives and our blood and unite them to his life and blood for the salvation of these tribes. Thus, on the 29th day of September, this angel of innocence and martyr of Jesus Christ was immolated in his 35th year for him who had given his life for his ransom. He had consecrated his heart and soul to God and his life and labor to the welfare of the poor Indians. St. René Goupil, pray for us. St. Charles Garnier Born in May of 1605 to an affluent Parisian family, young Charles was the apple of his parents' eyes. A naturally pious and obedient child, he never gave his parents cause for complaint until the day in 1632 that he told them he felt a call to be a missionary priest in the wilderness of New France. They were horrified at this prospect, and at first vehemently refused their permission, but they eventually relented, seeing in their son's adamant conviction the sure hand of God and the intercession of the Blessed Mother, to whom Charles had always had a great devotion. It was no coincidence that he was ordained a priest at the same time as St. Isaac Jogues in 1635, and it was with this charismatic adventurer for Christ that he crossed the Atlantic and route to New France shortly thereafter. During his first three years in the New World, young Father Garnier studied the Huron language, working at the mission in Osasana, which is on the Georgian Bay of Lake Huron. 
In November 1639, he labored alongside his friend Father Jogues to administer to the Petun tribe. Though their acceptance of the black robes was slow and resentful, Father Garnier patiently persisted until 1647 when finding that the tribe was finally beginning to show signs of trust and curiosity about the faith, he decided the time was right to open a couple new missions among the Patoon people, which were an offshoot tribe of the Iroquois. But Father had stepped squarely into the path of the enemy, the larger Iroquois nation, who not only bore an active hatred for the Jesuit missionaries, but had begun a war quest against the Patoon, threatening to burn their villages. All the more cause, reasoned Father Gardier, to secure the souls of the Patoon in the faith as soon as possible. In other words, he was undeterred, and spent the next two years making good headway into the hearts of the people, in spite of the constant threat from the enemy Iroquois. It was a cold day in December 1649, when Patoon scouts warned Father Garnier to leave the village, citing the signs of imminent attack. Father scrambled to prepare. A party of Patoon warriors were dispatched to apprehend the Iroquois war party before it reached the village, and Father Garnier gathered up the women, children, and elderly and sent them with his newly arrived assistant, Father Noel Chabanel, to safety at mission headquarters. But he, Father Garnier, would stay with the men left guarding the village. And so he did, and so he died. The Iroquois, having evaded the forward party of Patoon, surprised the unguarded mission, descending upon the remaining inhabitants like a hurricane, killing almost everyone in the village. Father Garnier tried to be everywhere at once to administer to the wounded and dying, and was shot twice in the attack, once in the chest and once in the abdomen. He was then stripped of his cassock and left to die in the cold. His last act was to absolve an Indian who was dying next to him, after which he received a tomahawk blow to the head. He had had a great devotion to the Blessed Mother, and his martyrdom taking place on December 7th, he was honored to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in heaven with the Queen herself. St. Charles Garnier, pray for us. The next North American martyr in line is St. Noel Chabanel. The youngest of four children born into the family of a public accountant in southern France in 1613, Noël Chabanel entered the seminary at Toulouse at the age of 17, following in the footsteps of an older brother. He was ordained in 1641 and taught rhetoric at several Jesuit colleges. He was a prized instructor, esteemed for his virtue and learning but seeking a greater challenge for the honor and glory of God and the salvation of souls, Noel requested to join the Jesuits at the mission in New France, and was subsequently sent overseas in 1643. His first year in the New World he spent as the chaplain of the Ursuline Convent in Quebec, a post far removed from what he must have imagined when he'd read the accounts of the missions in the report sent back to France. But, he eventually met Father Jogues, as everyone seemed to do, and was further inspired to join the missionary work with the tribes of the wilderness. In 1644, Father Chabanel finally had his chance to leave the safety of Quebec. Provided with an armed guard due to a recent rash of Indian raids, he accompanied Father Jogues to the mission of St. Marie, the first mission in Ontario near modern-day Midland, and there he began his life among the Huron already keenly aware that he tread a thin line between life and death. But the threat of martyrdom was almost beside the point for Father Chabanel. Mission life presented a particular challenge to this genteely reared man. Though he tried, he never was able to adapt to the primitive lifestyle, the culture, and the ways of the natives. His difficulty was so extreme that he lived in constant doubt of his ability to fulfill his vocation. He was repelled by the food that he was served, and he could barely tolerate the bad smells and lack of cleanliness. He willed to muscle through it, only knowing within himself just how much a bloodless martyrdom he suffered, living minute to minute in the mission with so little consolation, spiritual or otherwise and his was a sensitive personality, such that he felt acute sorrow at the death of his fellows. 
After the death of St. Isaac Jogues in 1647, he was offered the choice of returning to France, but he resisted the temptation, and, inspired perhaps by the courage and sacrificial spirit of St. Isaac Jogues, he made a vow to God that except for adherence to obedience to the order, he would remain with the Indians until his death, which came two years later, as it turned out just before he would have been recalled by obedience. Remember that under the threat of attack at Father Garnier's platoon mission in Ontario, Father Chabanel had been sent to safety, accompanying some of the converts back to the Jesuit headquarters at Christian Island. He'd recently gotten word of his recall to France, but reportedly had had a premonition, divine intuition maybe, that he would see his homeland in heaven before he'd ever again set eyes on his earthly homeland. And so it happened. On the journey to Christian Island, according to the accounts of the surviving converts, Father urged his followers to escape to run ahead of the sound of what they believed were Iroquois tracking them. He reassured them that he'd be right behind them, but not a man of great physical endurance, he was too exhausted to keep up, and fell further and further behind. The entire mission at Christian Island waited anxiously, but Father Chabanel never arrived at the fort. His fate was long uncertain, until a Huron apostate, one of the tribesmen who had escaped with Father Chabanel, eventually admitted to having killed him and thrown his body into the Natawasaga River, from which depths it was never recovered. One of his biographers Saluting the especially difficult trial of Father Chabanel's years in New France, calls St. Noel, quote, the silent hero of the hard trail, a patron of misfits, a patron of the lonely, disappointed, and abandoned. Certainly, a saint most of us have had occasion at some time in our lives to identify with. St. Noel Chabanel, pray for us. St. Antoine Daniel. Father Anthony Daniel was born at Dieppe in Normandy in May of 1601. After studying both philosophy and law, he heard God's call to the religious life and entered the Society of Jesus at Rouen in October of 1621. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1630 and taught at the Jesuit College at U for two years before embarking on the mission to New France, together with Father Ambrose de Vost. Father Daniel, it so happens, had a brother named Charles, who was a sea captain working for a French shipping company which had an interest on Cape Breton Island. So, arriving at St. Anne's Bay, Cape Breton, in 1633, the two priests were induced to remain for a year to administer to the Catholics who'd settled there. But by 1634, they'd moved inland to meet up with the mission headed by St. John de Brebeuf at St. Joseph Island, in the northwest part of Lake Huron where he labored for some time, quickly picking up the Huron language. Among other things, a father translated the creed and the Lord's Prayer into the native tongue, and then set them to music. For two years, he headed a school for Indian boys in present-day Quebec, until in 1638 he was sent to relieve Father Brebeuf in one of the new missions in Hurania, where he labored for about a decade, before returning to the chief mission of the Hurons. Shortly thereafter, in July of 1648, Father Daniel was caught up in a sudden attack from the Iroquois, strategically planned for a time when most of the warriors of the tribe were not in the fort. The Iroquois were wily that way. According to the account of one of the survivors, Father Daniel rallied the defenders, hurrying the women, children, and old men to the chapel just before the walls of the fort had been scaled by the enemy. He gave general absolution to all, and immersing his handkerchief in a bowl of water, he shook it over them, baptizing his catechumens by aspersion. Then Father Daniel, still in his vestments, took up a cross and walked toward the oncoming Iroquois. They halted for a moment, then fired on him, killing him. They then carried his body to the chapel and set it on fire. Many of the Indians who'd been sheltering in the chapel escaped to tell the tale. Father Daniel was the first martyr of the missionaries to the Hurons. Father Ragano, his superior, wrote of him in a letter to the superior general in France, describing Father Daniel as, quote, 
a truly remarkable man, humble, obedient, united with God, of never-failing patience and indomitable courage in adversity. Saint Antoine Daniel, pray for us. And last but not least, the other name perhaps most commonly recalled as one of the North American martyrs, Saint Jean de Brebeuf. Saint John was born on the 25th of March, 1593, in Normandy, France. Interestingly, he was the uncle of noted French poet Georges de Brebeuf and reportedly hailed from an illustrious Norman family. He was admitted into the Society of Jesus in 1617 at the age of 24, but was almost expelled when he contracted tuberculosis in 1620. By the will of God, however, what was more often than not a fatal illness in those days slowed down the young seminarian studies, but it didn't kill him. It would take more than TB to take out this warrior of the faith. In 1622, having recovered his health, St. John, then 29 years old, was ordained to the priesthood, and rather than follow the academic path of many Jesuits in Europe, he was anxious to throw himself into the missionary life. A tall, athletic man, he never considered himself an academic, but Father John had a God-given talent for languages that, along with his natural inclination toward an active life and a burning desire for the salvation of souls, would serve him well in a missionary vocation. And it seemed to be the will of God, as it was certainly St. John's will, to sail to New France to bring the light of the faith to the darkness of the pagan world. It took a few years to prove his health would not be an impediment to his goal, but he finally received permission from the order to travel to the New World to begin his life's work. At the age of 32, in 1625, he became the first missionary to the Hurons, and one of the most enduring among the Jesuit missionaries. He labored for souls in New France for a total of 24 years, the longest of any of the North American martyrs. Not surprisingly, he became proficient in the native language of the Hurons with all its nuances, and being uniquely capable, he composed a catechism and wrote a Huron dictionary, an endeavor instrumental in the missionary work of New France, as future candidates for the missions were expected to study the language before beginning any kind of conversion work. Without a doubt, his grasp of the language inclined Father Brebeuf to greater understanding of the natives, but it was often remarked upon by his compatriots that he of all the Jesuits just fit in with the culture and had little difficulty adapting to life in the wilderness. He was a tall, broad man, unafraid of hard work, and the Indians, having hunted and traveled with the priest, witnessed his strength and physical endurance and named him Echan, meaning he who carries the load, a trait that describes this saint both physically and in the strength of his character. He was famous among the natives and the missionary fathers for both, but his rapport with the Hurons couldn't save him from the enemy of the Hurons, the Iroquois, who took Father Brebeuf and Father Gabriel Lalamont captive in 1649, killing them both after many hours of extreme torture, as already described. It's recorded that as part of their ritual, the Iroquois drank St. Jean de Brebeuf's blood and ate his heart as well, in an effort to absorb de Brebeuf's courage in so stoically enduring the pain of his death. And though this pagan practice accomplished nothing, the sacrifice and prayers of their victims produced amazing fruit. It's estimated that St. Jean de Brebeuf had converted 7,000 souls before his martyrdom and many thousands more afterward by his intercession. St. John de Brebeuf, pray for us. And in the way of an epilogue, little headway into the conversion of the natives seemed obvious during the lifetimes of all eight of these noble martyrs. But shortly after their martyrdoms, it seems the spiritual gates into the hearts of the Indians were thrown open and grace flowed abundantly by the intercession most definitely of these eight holy Jesuits. Shortly after the death of Noel Chabanel in 1649, the superior of the Huron missions, Father Ragineau, began the process for the canonization of these eight missionaries slain by the Iroquois. All eight were canonized by Pope Pius XI in 1930 and are honored as the patron saints of North America. 
Prayer for the Intercession of the North American Martyrs O God, who inflamed the hearts of your blessed martyrs with an admirable zeal for the salvation of souls, grant me, I beseech you, my petitions and all the requests recommended today, so that the favors obtained through their intercession may make manifest before men the power and glory of your name. Amen. St. John de Brebeuf, pray for us. St. Isaac Jogues, pray for us. St. Gabriel Alamont, pray for us. St. Anthony Daniel, pray for us. St. Charles Garnier, pray for us. St. Noel Chabanel, pray for us. St. René Goupil, pray for us. St. John de Lalande, pray for us. Holy Mary, Queen of the Martyrs, pray for us. And a special greeting to our friend, Sister Noel Marie, on her feast day.